80% of success is psychology and 20% is mechanics. Resources are never the problem. It's a lack of resourcefulness is why you failed. Resourcefulness is the ultimate resource. And if you don't have what you want, it's because you haven't committed yourself where you would burn your boats. If you want to take the fucking island, burn your fucking boats and you will take the island because people, when they're going to either die or succeed, tend to succeed. But most of us give ourselves a way out and that's why we don't have what we want. Previously on the Last Kingdom Review episode. And even though I want to think that Osin is doing this on purpose by not allowing Ohan to be the leader of the whole right wing and forcing them to try to awaken their units. Right now I can't buy that because that seems like there's too many variables going on and Osin seems like he wants to have everything within his control. So to me it seems a bit out of character but if he's able to predict something like the awakening of Ohan and Shin's units then Osin is more overpowered than I could have ever imagined. I am a stranger to you. You have no idea what I'm capable of. What is up YouTube? Live via satellite here and today we are talking Kingdom Manga Chapter 583. So it looks like Osin predicted the awakenings after all. And the funny thing is I really wanted this to be the case because I thought it went really well with that burn the boats video I made about six months ago which was pretty much just a theory video about what I thought Osin's strategy was. But I had to play that clip back from 578 because at that time even I thought that this was a bit too risky of a move for Osin to be making. But after reading this last chapter, we now know with 100% certainty that not only did Osin predict the awakenings, he actually in a sense through his manipulation caused the awakenings to even happen. So while many of us including Denrimi thought that Osin was taking this huge gamble, Osin yet again shows us that if he's going to be playing blackjack, he's definitely going to be counting cards. Gambling? Who's saying anything about gambling? It's not gambling when you know you're going to win. Counting cards is a foolproof system. It's also illegal. It's not illegal. It's frowned upon like masturbating on an airplane. I'm pretty sure that's illegal too. Yeah, maybe after 9-11 where everybody gets so sensitive. Thanks a lot, Bin Laden. Alright, so the chapter starts out on the 12th night and we actually find ourselves with Kane delivering the message from Roboku to Giyun, Shigaru, and Benanji. And I have to admit, here I was kind of surprised because after Kane delivers her message from Roboku, she asked them if they have any questions. But the thing that raised my eyebrows was not only did Shigaru say that he didn't have any questions, but he also said that he had a very similar plan already. And also for Kane to deliver a message back to Roboku that he can focus on the center because their left wing will not be broken through. So even though the first part of this conversation seems pretty useless with Kane delivering some information that they pretty much were already going to do anyway, I think what this was mainly supposed to be showing us was that Shigaru was already thinking on the same wavelength as Roboku. But things get a little more interesting as Kane sets off to return back to camp. For some reason, after Benaji is trying to convince Kane to stick around a little while for some drinks, Giyun realizes that the messenger is actually Kane. And the weirdest thing about this to me was like, this seemed to be like Giyun's first time meeting Kane. I'm thinking to myself, like, how did you not meet Kane by now? But the reason Giyun's even bringing any attention to this is we find out that since his master Rin Sojo died, he actually experiences some of the same type of bizarre dreams that his master had when he was alive. And after finding out Giyun's dream, even though Fuzzy was about Kane, Benanji just can't help himself as he pretty much says what everybody had to be thinking at this moment like well were they lewd dreams? Which was pretty funny but we all know that Giyun is just too serious a man for that. But uh, Fute on the other hand. <laughs> and here's where all hell breaks loose because after Giyun pretty much starts out with a positive remark about Kane's loyalty for Roboku and how it actually reminds him of the loyalty that he along with Shigaru once had for Rin Sojo. The problem comes when Giyun says that he only hopes that she doesn't share the same fate as them as well. And it doesn't take Kane long to realize exactly what Giyun means by this. And I mean Kane literally goes off here. I mean she draws her sword and everything. She's yelling at Benaji and the rest of them about the way he phrased that line. It's almost like he's trying to jinx them. Saying that she would lose her master the same way that Shigaru and Giyun lost theirs. Essentially saying that Roboku would die. 
And even though Giyun did try to defend himself saying that he didn't say it was certain, King continues blasting him, even turning the tables telling him not to lump her in with them. Because not only will Roboku not die, if he were ever in danger of death, she would jump in front of him and die in his stead. And if that weren't possible, she'd be the first to follow him into the next world. Saying that she would never eke out a meaningless existence like the two of them did, and that she'll never become like them. And after that, Kane pretty much storms off, but even even Banaji asked the question Giyun like what was that all about? But Giyun shakes this off by saying that he really didn't mean anything by it and he kind of wishes that he never said anything to begin with because he believed that they'll be the victors of this battle anyway. So when it comes to this prophecy that Giyun had I find it kind of interesting because I really don't think it's foreshadowing the death of Roboku because in all honesty everybody knows that Roboku eventually will die. But I actually think that the importance of this scene has more to do with Kane and what her future would actually hold for her if Roboku did die. And even though Kane's talking pretty reckless here about how she would follow Roboku into death, I could actually see Roboku doing the exact same thing that Rin Sojo did for Giyun and Shigaru and actually forbidding Kane to follow him into the next world. And maybe even giving her the blessing to join the Chin side at the end of this and maybe that's how her and Ten wind up teaming up in the future. And that's just my own thoughts about that, but getting back on track, even though Kane mocked both Giyun and Shigaru about not following their master into the afterlife, Giyun finds himself thankful for many things, and we're let in on what two of those things actually are. And the first is his master in Sojo, but the second thing is actually the existence of the awakened He Shin and Gyokoho units. Because him and Jigaru see them as worthy opponents that they can unleash everything they've had pent up until this moment. And Kiyun says that they will come at them with everything they have and show them the might of those who once exchanged blows with great generals of an era past. And with that we find ourselves in the middle of battle on day 13. And with the battle raging on the right the focus turns to the center army, in particular the Osun army HQ. And here we see that Osun is getting reports and everything looks like good news. We see that the Heishin unit and Kyokuho unit have engaged the enemy and just like the day before are going all out pushing the enemy back proving that yesterday was not a fluke. And then we find ourselves at one of the most interesting parts of the entire chapter as we see that Denrimi, the third commander of the Osun army has a lot of questions about what osun has been doing recently. And the funny thing about these questions is that it seems like these questions are exactly the same type of questions that us Kingdom fans have been wanting the answers to. I mean, he's asking things like, did Osun not send reinforcements to the right side because he knew that Ohan and Shin's units would awaken? But also, wasn't it a bit of a gamble? Because had it not worked, the entire right wing would have been lost. If anything, he probably should have just promoted Ohan in general the same way he did Moten and had the entire right wing rally around him. But it's at this point where Denrimi gets an awakening of his own and he realizes that it was by not allowing Ohan to become commander is precisely what allowed the awakenings to be possible. And had Ohan actually been appointed commander, then the right wing would have been in a worse position than they are right now. And Denrimi has to ask himself, did Osun really see this far ahead? But we soon find out that Denrimi wasn't the only one to come to this conclusion as we're introduced to So-O, the fourth commander of the Osun army. And right away this guy comes onto the scene with a little bit of a different type of vibe than you're used to seeing in the Osun army. Saying that Osun is just one surprise after another. When it comes to him predicting the Gyoko Ho's awakening, that's one thing. But he was completely shocked that Osun predicted that the Tahitian unit would awaken too. But Osun is quick to correct So-O by telling him that it was actually the opposite. He actually expected for the Heishin unit to awaken while he saw the Kyokuho as a little bit of a gamble. So after this WTF moment from Osun's men, So-O brazenly asks if in the eyes of Osun the Heishin unit is actually superior than the Kyokuho. But before Osun even has the chance to answer this question, So-O is scolded by the others for even asking such a question. And even though the situation is kind of making it look like Osun Osun acknowledges Shin more than he does Ohan, I really don't think that's the case because we all know when it comes to Osun, nothing's ever really that simple. But So-O has not yet gotten his fill of questions as he asks Osun, with them being so close that they can finally catch a whiff of Roboku, will they be mounting a full charge if the right wing is able to break through? But Osun doesn't believe it to be that easy because he doesn't believe that Zhao's left wing is weak enough yet. 
he even suggests that this is because on the ninth day when Akka was taken out, the target in their plan should not have been to take out Gakue, but to take out Jigaryu who is the brains of the left wing. Which prompts O to, to ask his final question about this last trial, asking Osun what is his prediction, will the right be able to conquer this final obstacle? Hearing this, then Remy's had enough, telling So that he forgets his place, but Osun actually answers him, saying that he expected better from him. Turning the tables, asking him a question for once, saying, Do you think I would have moved up here if I expected them to fail? And then we find ourselves on the right side of the battlefield with Ohan and Shin in the heat of battle, both realizing that Chigaryu and Giyun are starting to make their moves. But before we can get too deep into that, we switch focus over to the Zhao Center army. And here we see that Kane and Fute are chopping it up, but it seems like Kane is still in a pretty bad mood. And Fute's not helping her mood at all, asking her to tell him what Roboku's plan was for the left wing. And after denying Fute of this intel at first, she couldn't help but to let him in on a plan after seeing the idiotic plan that he came up with, which I thought was actually kind of funny. But she lets him know that it's actually kind of simple. And she says that the Chin right wing is a cart being held up by the two wheels of the Gyokuho unit and the He Shin unit and all they need to do is just focus on taking one of them out. And even though Fute thinks that Shin's going to be the target of the plan, Kane lets him know that it's exactly the opposite. And as we zoom back in on the battle on the right wing, we see that the battle is intensifying and that the Zhao are starting to make their move and find out from the narrator that on this 13th day, a shock would run through the Chin right wing that Ohan would be defeated. And that was the chapter in a nutshell, guys. All right, so to me, guys, I love this chapter at Kingdom, all right? Any chapter where you actually get to see Osin doing anything has to be a good chapter. And this chapter was really packed full with a lot of information. And since I think we covered the Kane and Giyun stuff pretty well at the beginning, I think I'm just gonna jump right to the Osin stuff. And the first thing we have to talk about is that during this chapter, it's actually been confirmed that these awakenings were a part of Osun's plan. But the thing about this Osun stuff, man, is that every single step, you have to ask yourself another question. Think about it. Even though we already know this is a part of Osun's plan, which plan was it a part of? Was it a part of plan A or was it a part of plan B? Because in plan A, Akko never gets hurt, right? So basically, would the awakening have been needed if Akko never got injured? And if so, would Osun have gone about it in a similar way? And of course, we'll never have the answer to these questions, but the reason I'm bringing it up is because it's easy to forget that this really wasn't a part of Osun's initial plan. And if you take a step back, you can almost appreciate how crazy this move is. Because if you remember, Roboku's the one who's actually responsible for Akko being defeated, because he met up with Benaji and shared with him the secret to defeating Akko's defense. But this is where, in my opinion, Osun proves that he's on a whole different level than most generals in this series. He took the defeat of Akko and turned it around and used it against Roboku. He turned what Roboku considered to be a disadvantage into an advantage and forced both Shin and Ohan to awaken. And when I say force, that's exactly what I mean because everything Osun did served a purpose. Not sending help from the center, not promoting Ohan, all of these different things started to make the Chin right wing feel as if Osun had abandoned them. Combine that with the fact that they were nearly out of food and you could see that Osun put them in the perfect scenario where they were either going to sink or swim. Even when you go back and look at the speeches that Ohan and Shin used to awaken their troops, Osun is clearly the catalyst in these speeches that caused these awakenings. And the reason I don't think it's that big a deal that Osun considered Shin the guarantee to awaken and Ohan more of the gamble is because I think that Shin was actually easier to analyze. I think the moment that Osun saw Shin carrying Oki's glaive, he knew that he was on the cusp of going to the next level. But when it comes to Ohan, it's not like he's below Shin, but there's a lot more variables when it comes to him being as their father and son. Just to give an example, it's a lot harder for Ohan to make a speech about Osun because that is still his dad. So it's a lot harder for him to have to actually put his own personal business on blast. And it could be seen as a risk because maybe that's enough to make him not want to do the speech at all. Another good example would be if Ohan just decided to do his own thing and in his desperation took control of the right wing anyway without even getting the approval of Osun. Osun could have possibly saw that as a risk because if you remember back in the Fire Dragons of Way arc, Osun actually predicted that Toe would call for his help. The only reason that Osun's prediction wound up being incorrect is because Ohan himself stepped in and told Toe that he absolutely must not call Osun. And mind you, that was the only time Osun was ever wrong in the entire series and Ohan had something to do with it. So for him to think Ohan was a slight gamble, I really don't think was that big a deal. 
And even though everything went according to Osun's plan, I still want to look at things from a different perspective because if this hadn't worked out, the entire right wing would have been finished. So to me, that actually seems like a pretty big risk and really out of character for somebody like Osun who is known not to take risk. And for me, the only two things that would eliminate this being a big risk on Osun's part would be either one that we find out that he has more food stores, so the shortage wasn't as big a concern as it was made out to be, or two, we find out that he had some sort of backup plan if this awakening didn't occur. Other than that, we just have to assume that Osun's taking far more risk than he would under normal circumstances. And if that's the case, I actually have a little theory why. And I was going to save this and make a whole separate theory video about this subject, but knowing me and how long it takes me to even make a video, I decided I'll just toss it into the review. And it actually has to do with what Osun asked Shohikin for. So one thing I think that would cause Osun to be more of a risk taker in this war would actually be if his reward when this war was over was so great in such a once in a lifetime opportunity that he felt that he had to do whatever was necessary, even gamble from time to time to get this W. And like I said in the original video about what I thought Osun asked Shohikin for, I thought he asked him for political power. But at the time, I couldn't think of a position that he could really ask for because Shohikin and Shobunkun both currently hold the chancellor seats, the chancellor of the left and the chancellor of the right. But I completely forgot about another seat and that was the seat that Ryo Fui once held and that was the chancellor of the state. Now would Say agree to this? I don't know, but when you look at the other commanders in the other states like Karen for Chu, she's actually prime minister. When you look at Roboku for Zhao, he's actually a prime minister. So it would make perfect sense for Osun to slot into one of these official roles. And we all know that Osun has his ambitions and some say he even has ambitions to one day become a king. But in order for any of that to even begin to take place, Osun does have to begin to get involved a little bit more on the political side of things. And I do think if that's the reward that Osun's seeking after this war, then yeah, I think it's definitely probably the reason that he's been acting a little bit out of character this arc. But another thing we definitely have to talk about with this chapter is Ohan possibly being defeated. And I highly doubt that Ohan's gonna die, like his story has way too much left in it. I mean, he hasn't resolved any of the issues with his own dad, so there's no possible way that Ohan can die here. But the character I'm actually more worried about dying here is actually Banyo. And it makes a lot of sense because if you think about it, Banyo has actually been more of a father figure to Ohan than Osun has been. So if Banyo dies on the battlefield, it's almost like Ohan's losing his father. And I wouldn't be surprised if that was a crippling blow to Ohan. Other than that, the only thing I could really see happening is maybe Ohan being outsmarted and losing a lot of men to Chikaryu's army or getting severely injured like how Akko is. But death for Ohan is just clearly off the table. And the way they're kind of making it look at the end of the chapter, it kind of seems like Shin may actually intervene and actually save Ohan. But we'll have to wait and see how that all plays out. But it kind of did look like his instincts was letting him know that Ohan was in danger. And it would just be another slap in the face if Ohan was put out of commission and Shin was actually made general of the entire right wing. And I doubt that would happen, but the way Kingdom's been going lately, you just never know. But the only other thing I had, man, was I really kind of liked that new character we saw this chapter, um, So O. Oh. It was just something about the character design and the way he was talking to Osun. He just seems kind of interesting. I even kind of like the way his army looks. Like they all have that same type of like fancy spear weapon. And I actually can't tell if the person behind him with the funny helmet design is actually a dude. Or when you look close, it kind of looks like it may be a woman. But yeah, I just wanted to bring that up because I did think that was pretty cool. But moving on to the comment of the week. And this week's comment goes out to Denzel. And what he has to say is, would be crazy if Ohan gets defeated and Shin gets to slay all three Zhao generals. And yeah, that would definitely be crazy. That'd be putting a whole lot on Shin. The only thing I could possibly see happening somewhat similar to this scenario would be if Ohan got defeated and Kyokai, Ten, and Shin all split up to each take on like separate generals. For instance, like Kyokai takes on Bananji, Shin takes on Gyun, and Ten teams up with somebody like Akakin or Kanjo and tries to use her strategy and tactics to defeat Chogaryu. And even though this scenario is totally unrealistic, I am still hoping that somewhere in this arc, Ten finds a way to redeem herself because she has to do something, right? But anyway, guys, that about does it for this week's review. Let me know what you guys thought of the chapter in the comments section below. Please leave a like if you enjoyed the video and feel free to share, comment, and subscribe. Peace out.